Commissioner, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great privilege for me to be here in the context of uh, a such a gathering uh, held by Irish Presidency. I think that today when we are talking more about euroscepticism, it is a very good reason to talk about euro-optimism. And I congratulate uh, the Irish uh, Presidency for this uh, initiative. And I remember very well, Mr. Chairman, I was Chief Negotiator of Romania. And I remember very well in the spring 2004, when you held this uh, again, the Presidency, you uh, were in a very good position for uh, setting an optimist signal both to the Central and Southeastern uh, European countries. I think that uh, it is a good reason for euro optimists and to congratulate and uh, welcome uh, Croatia to uh, European uh, Union. I think that the enlargement policy of the European Union has substantially transformed the countries of Central and Southeastern Europe. It was a promising and is still a promising European future to the neighboring societies. Proof that EU ability to provide regional leadership. Offer a commitment to more effective engagement gave to both European countries and European citizens, and represented the liberal democratic answer to the challenge of globalization. I fully agree with uh, State uh, Secretary Lopatka. In the previous years, we didn't talk about enlargement, and uh, I have to say that uh, uh, it is uh, uh, a merit of uh, Commissioner uh, Fulezet in the last period of time, we have and we uh, uh, talk about uh, a new approach of uh, enlargement uh, policy. I think that uh, uh, 20 years ago, when the European Council in Copenhagen decided for, uh, uh, you know, releasing this uh, criteria, uh, for enlargement, it was really a historical moment. Uh, ten years ago, Thessaloniki conclusion offered a sense of euro-optimism to the Western Balkan countries and brought, and this is, in my opinion, a very important issue, brought the rational argument for both widening and deepening of European integration. Uh, because uh, the phrase uh, enlargement fatigue since uh, 2005 uh, proved to be a visible decline, in my opinion, in support for enlargement. This phrase served as a cover for other problems of the European Union. And uh, this phrase uh, realistically uh, meant the enlargement reticence of some uh, member states. Commissioner Fule is right. The enlargement reticence was and still is a significant concept, but it could be overcome by improving the credibility of the process. It needs a rigorous application of accession criteria and involvement of public within the process of enlargement. I have to, to say that in the last period of time, in the last two, three years, we can <coughs> talk about uh, smart and efficient management of enlargement uh, uh, process. I think that uh, we are talking today both about uh, clarification in some areas of uh, both enlargement policy and negotiation uh, process, and in approaching uh, the single market from the point of view of both member states and neighborhood area, and taking in consideration the EU objectives of global competitiveness of the European Union. The new approach 
of enlargement. I think that contains the lessons learned from previous wave of enlargement. The benchmarking, uh, benchmarking system is originated in a dramatic change of the accession strategy in spring 2004 during Irish presidency. But today, the current benchmarking helps the difficult reform and transformation process, provides certainty to all negotiating parties, and a clear roadmap for candidate countries. In order to manage a larger union of many member states, it is necessary to get a proper functioning of the core institution in charge with democratic governance and rule of law, the judicial and law enforcement systems, fighting against organized crime and corruption, developing an efficient public administration. I would like to focus very briefly on three issues. First, the issue of absorption capacity. It was raised first, uh, absorption capacity in, of the European Union and member states. It was raised in 2006, and I think that uh, uh, today, it is part of the public debate regarding the enlargement uh, process. Why? Because the EU capacity to absorb new members should not pose a threat to the advancement of that policy, of enlargement policy. Because the current EU system of conditionality asks for candidate countries to demonstrate a track record in implementing reforms, not adopting only, but implementing reforms, but in the same time, the EU must meet its obligations to allow candidates to join the European Union if reforms have been met. I think that the Union capacity demands on the current members to introduce the reform necessary for enlarged European Union, both in Brussels and uh, uh, domestically. In the previous wave of enlargement, both EU institutions and majority of member states were not very uh, well prepared for developing of widening process into a strong integration process. Several experts noted that the absorption capacity of EU was a convenience for some member states for delay the process and sometimes uh, it was uh, considered one of uh, uh, the main problem of so-called power share. In line, in connection with uh, absorption capacity, I, I would like to focus on the role of member states. Just a few words. I think that from previous experience of enlargement, we can say that enlargement preferences reflected more national utility, not European identity and values. The EU members deliberately use differentiated membership as an instrument that may be used to resolve distributional conflicts. I think that both the member states and candidate states must adapt and adjust domestic structures and processes to the demand of engagement with the European Union. The need for consensus in the Council ask for bilateral issues uh, to be uh, uh, resolved uh, both uh, bilaterally before the enlargement process starts and in several times, in several occasions, to use of international forums and courts. And in this case, I think that Commission should set up its own arbitration mechanism for enlargement-related disputes. The enlargement process requires a smart management in the Union's relationship with other European partners and beyond. Member States government, governments should communicate both the benefits of enlargement and cost of non-enlargement. And my last remark refers to the role of the markets. The economic and market criteria of enlargement are not very clearly defined. 
The assessment of the functional market economy criteria involves both the member states and market actors. The enlargement had opened new markets and it was up to business to take advantage of the single market. Milzov in uh, international relations underlines the lack of interconnected be uh, between uh, balance of national interest and European interest during the Easter enlargement mm -hmm. and the disadvantages of candidate parties. The way the Jacobis memo two years ago shows that the EU did apply a minimal kind of management towards Central and East European region in order to bring advantages to the old member states' economic model. The transformation process of uh, this area included the ad hoc strategies and offensive strategies of private entities from member states. I think that both the EU and member state decision makers did use a selective modernization approach towards this uh, process. For this reason, next enlargement wave must involve in markets, must involve the market, sorry, in the constructivist approach, including in the strategies of the European Union. And few conclusions. Previous enlargements were part of uh, a broader process of transformation and renewal of Western Europe and of the European Union. I think that we have to uh, look to the enlargement policy as part of the strategy of EU modernization. I think that Eastern enlargement started as a twin dynamic widening and deepening process. It requires a complete restructuring of the European Union. It poses the question of redefining the European integration process itself in the context of globalization. It asks for rediscovering a new Europe, and for this reason, I think that we have to continue the enlargement process. Material self interest and power differentials shape the Eastern enlargement. We need to replace the rhetorical actions approach with a dialectical relationship between strategic actions and cultural values and norms. This must be the new approach of enlargement. Eastern enlargement and the current debate in the member states underline the influence of national interest. We must focus on strengthening of European interest when arguing the issue of absorption capacity. It is very important to manage the influence of member states and markets on the policy area and its corresponding legal body. Managing the next stage of enlargement proves the e European Union is an important actor of post-crisis European and global reconstruction. It gives us a more confident European Union and a more effective regional and global engagement. It requires a true European leadership and a wider perspective for European citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you.